good evening, good morning uh, from wherever you're joining. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you all uh, with us for the Thinkers Dialogue. Today we have a guest, uh, I think a person who does not need any introduction because you must have seen so many of her pieces across newspapers. And I'm sure if you are somebody who's following India, must have read her book, uh, The Last Decade, uh, 2008 to uh, 2018. That's the time frame uh, on which she's talking about in the book. Uh, very critically acclaimed book. Uh, in fact, I did read that in one sitting, I must confess, and I just love the whole narrative and how she's really looked at the history of how things have actually happened in India. Uh, other than that, that uh, Pooja, uh, Pooja Mehra, who's joining us today, Pooja is a New Delhi-based journalist. She has worked with Hindu, Business World, Business Today. I think she just worked with the finest of uh, business media, the uh, enterprises across the board. Uh, she has covered the various ministries, she has looked at the Planning Commission, and then she followed up the Niti Aayog. But most of all, uh, she received the Ramnath Goenka Excellence in Journalism Award twice, in 2008 and 2009. So somebody who has impeccable credentials, uh, and uh, she has agreed to join us today. Thanks a lot, Pooja, for joining in. Uh, it's just a pleasure and an honor to have you with us uh, for this interaction. Thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Thank you so much. The, it, it's an honor for me to be on your list of uh, uh, people you're having these conversations with. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bija. So we'll just uh, quickly dive into the uh, conversation. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, when your title, the book title itself, How India's uh, Growth Story Devolved into Growth Without a Story. That's a very, very uh, courageous uh, title itself. Now, why did you do this? And what was the motivation to really do this book? The motivation to do this book um, really came from the fact that, you know, uh, we read a lot of books uh, about what goes on in corridors of power and how that affects our lives, the economy, uh, the economic aspects in our lives, uh, books that are authored by um, um, bureaucrats, politicians, uh, senior journalists and editors. And uh, uh, so those are perspectives, uh, you know, they come from certain perspectives. But um, I'd like to say that sometimes they also have their own agendas, you know, there's always a mistake to be explained, um, uh, something to be whitewashed, a uh, case to be made for a, a next job. Um, I think what has been missing from the discourse uh, in India on <clears throat> the political economy has been the perspective of a mid-career journalist, uh, who I would like to say is uh, probably uh, uh, less uh, inclined to be dishonest, or let's say is likely to be slightly more honest because uh, you, know, you don't have those kind of agendas. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry you know, uh, for saying this, but that's what I felt. And I, uh, I felt that as a journalist, you, know, you get to see so much that goes on, uh, which does not get, um, captured in the public discourse. And I thought that there were huge gaps in the public discourse. And what I wanted to do is just, you know, try to uh, fill up some of those gaps. So that's really what I was trying to do. And that's how that book came about. Sorry, I've lost your voice. I said, your I'll go to the book, uh, but I have a very, you made a very pointed, uh, what do you call it, point that is, it was written from a perspective of a mid-career journalist. And that's the time when you're probably not corrupt, uh, right? Or <laughs> so, so what are you really trying to say? Like that you have seen no. the other side, which is naughty or uh, what? what no, you... I, I, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that, you know, we, there are no stakes for you, no? I mean, uh, you have no interest in, in, in uh, coloring the narrative. Uh, uh, you're not looking for a... Uh, a bureaucrat, uh, you know, needs to explain something where they went wrong, probably, uh, uh, you know, when, 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 when finance secretary writes a book or an RBI governor writes a book, they're trying to say why they did something or why they didn't do something. That's mainly why they're writing the book. Uh, when a politician is writing a book, uh, you know, uh, their agenda is to say that, you know, uh, look, at, look, at, look at my career, you know, look at what all I can do. Uh, when a senior journalist, when an editor writes a book, he's, uh, you know, they, they, they tend to have all kinds of uh, agenda. We all know what it is like. But for a mid-career journalist, what are you really, you know, you, what are you really trying to prove? There's, there's nothing you're trying to explain. You know, you're not trying to say, uh, you know, you, there, there's no mistake you have to explain. So, uh, you know, I just thought that, you know, readers may want to, may be interested in reading what I have to say. 
I thought I had something to say. I thought something. I, I had something to add to the public discourse. The of course, there is so much that I find which is new and very interesting perspectives. But then, if you really look at the book, uh, you've done it in four distinct pastures, uh, as I see it, and those are the four chapters or whatever. Uh, of course, you start with the global crisis in 2008, and then go on to talk about the uh, recovery destroyed. Uh, and then, of course, the slow recovery and then recovery destroyed again. So could you just give a quick snapshot as to how do you really look at the economic history of India, especially in those 10 years that you're talking about? And then we'll jump on to the present times as well. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, what, what happens is that we tend to sometimes look at the economy in terms of one government versus, uh, you know, a second government, because usually approach to policy uh, tends to get identified with personalities, and usually personalities of either finance ministers or prime ministers. Uh, and I was, in fact, approached to co-author a book, uh, you know, on, um, on the first term of the Modi government, the economic policy uh, under Mr. Modi when he was prime minister from 2014 to 2019. Uh, and uh, while I was researching for uh, this particular book's proposal, uh, which eventually did not happen, um, when I was researching for this, I felt that it was kind of, uh, it wouldn't capture everything that had happened, you know, in the economy if you were to only look at the five years, because a lot of things that were happening, both in terms of policy decisions, as well as the trajectory of the economy itself, you know, the macroeconomy, a lot of it um, had started to happen a lot sooner than 2014, uh, you know, and I thought that the, uh, you know, the, the time stamp that uh, everything was sort of the turning point had been the global financial crisis. A lot of decisions, policy decisions, and, and changes in the economy that had taken place as a result of the global financial crisis, that is what had played out in the economy. And uh, that was continuing to play out in the economy uh, 2014 onwards as well. And uh, so I, you know, so that's what made 2008 the starting point. So that's why I describe what, what happened uh, uh, during the global financial crisis, very briefly internationally, but then how it was handled in India, and I thought, it, and I write in the book that you know it was handled quite well, um, uh, and that is uh, in the ten years that was mainly uh, the one period where uh, economists in government, decision makers, were given a free hand by the government to take decisions more or less. And uh, so a uh, lot of uh, decisions were taken to mitigate the impact uh, and sort of cushion the Indian economy from the impact of the global financial crisis. And those played out at some point. So that's the first chapter. Uh, the second chapter is about how, you know, these decisions were beginning to show results and the economy did in fact recover. But um, uh, for certain political reasons, uh, um, um, mainly Finance Minister Pranam Mukherjee took decisions uh, which led to overstimulation of the economy. And those were policy errors. And he took those decisions, although he had advice not to do all of this. Uh, so he sort of either overruled or defied in case of uh, when he was uh, given probably this advice by the Prime Minister. So, uh, you know, he, he took quite a few decisions, in fact. Uh, the, the whole NPA crisis started during his term, and that again is related to the financial crisis because, because of the financial crisis, a lot of companies had lost orders and demand had shrunk, and uh, uh, they were not able to repay their loans. So uh, there were instructions from the finance minister to go a little easy on defaults, to uh, make more and more loans. So, you know, that's the starting of the NPA crisis, the banking crisis. Uh, uh, because of the overstimulation, there was a whole inflation problem. There was a, tr uh, a, tr a tremendous inflation problem, and then you know what happened uh, in the U.S. The, the taper tantrums that gets talked about that again resulted in uh, problems here. So, so the, the the second chapter is about how there was a brief recovery, but you know uh, towards the end of this chapter, this recovery begins to get destroyed. The second chapter, the third chapter, describes actually how uh, you know. Uh, this was uh, the, uh, this recovery was uh, destroyed because of all these poor this poor decision making and then you know there's this brief period of hope where after the policy paralysis the 2G scam and all of those uh, you know chaotic complete chaos uh, in Delhi and the, the ramifications of that in uh, across the economy uh, how there was this brief uh, spell of hope. Uh, where everybody thought that uh, this uh, chief minister who had a re reputation for very good governance and very good decision making 
was likely to become the prime minister. And he did, in fact, win the election and become prime minister. And that, you know, there will be a big cleanup. All decisions that are not being taken for a long period of time will get taken. Uh, uh, the economy will change. The good days will be here. And uh, so, uh, so that happened. Uh, but then, uh, again, you know, uh, when Mr. Modi becomes the prime minister, uh, he does not take the decisions that everybody expected him to take. And he did inherit, in fact, the economy in a recovery, slight recovery stage, because after Mr. Pranam Mukherjee became president, there were some corrective step, steps in the last 18 months of the UPA government that were taken. The taper tantrum, uh, uh, how it was playing out in India, that, uh, you know, the macroeconomic crisis was brought under control uh, um, by RBI governor Raghuram Rajan and his uh, counterparts in Delhi, uh, his uh, colleagues in Delhi. And uh, so, uh, so the slight recovery that, uh, you know, uh, the uptrend in the trajectory of economic growth that Mr. Modi inherited could have been built upon if he had taken care of the banking crisis, if he had uh, taken a whole lot of other decisions that were required to be taken. He had a huge uh, benefit of uh, the, the oil price increase, you know, that it suddenly uh, reversed and oil prices were helpful for, for the economy. Uh, but uh, he did not capitalize on all of those uh, gains, and he made, in fact, new mistakes, such as demonetization, a new shock, um, a GST, which was very badly planned and designed. And uh, he did not uh, address, his government did not address uh, the farming sec uh, uh, sector's problems, you know, that, it, that had been sort of there for some time. And uh, so it was last opportunity. And this recovery, the second recovery, you know, the first one was after the global financial crisis. This is the second uh, recovery that he inherited. Again, this got destroyed. And that's the fourth chapter on how, uh, you know, the recovery was destroyed. So briefly, that's that's the sort of, uh, your audio, sorry. This, this is a very interesting journey that you're really uh, capturing. But let, let's go back to 2014. Uh, when Prime Minister Modi takes office, I think there were some very positive decisions to begin with. In fact, uh, it, uh, he did come to office with a very positive uh, very well, uh, view to how things need to be changed. He actually did listen to a lot of people. He made some positive steps. Uh, so uh, do you think you're actually being brutally uh, or brutal on him in terms of saying that everything just went wrong or there were some mistakes that have actually gone on to a long, uh, uh, wrong side of the history? No, actually, uh, in that chapter, I do describe some of the things that he did rather well. Uh, I, uh, I, I think his government did very well on the insolvency and bankruptcy court, for instance. Uh, I, I thought that his government did very well to finally make sure that India was going to have a GST, a goods and services tax, which is something that had been pending for a very long time. I thought, uh, I describe, uh, you know, how uh, his government uh, uh, gave final shape and introduced uh, the inflation targeting framework, which is, you know, sometimes we, we, it seems very technical and we don't understand how important it is. But, you know, uh, here's a government that's committing itself to, uh, keeping its spending in control because ultimately that's really what impacts, uh, you know, that uh, the monetary policy framework, the inflation targeting monetary policy framework has has implications also for how much a government spends and which which politician, you know, likes likes to reduce or put checks on, you know, how much they spend. So, so there are many examples. In fact, uh, there's a there's a huge section on the uh, planning commission being uh, dismantled and the Niti I O being introduced in place of the planning commission. Uh, the planning commission, you know, that style of thinking had outlived its uh, utility, and uh, you know, even the previous government had recorded that, but they were not, they had not succeeded. Uh, Montex and Alwali had not succeeded in in sort of uh, designing the successor to planning commission. So uh, initially, I thought they did very well. The whole making India, you know, uh, I talk a lot about the making India. In the book. Uh, I, I thought that was just what was needed to address the jobs crisis. Uh, I think what happened, uh, you know, uh, with Mr. Modi's government is that in the first few months, all of these decisions were very good. Uh, but when, uh, uh, you know, and this is something that political analysts need to really look at, uh, you know, I just make a guess over here. But I think when he lost the Delhi election, which is the, uh, you know, first uh, uh, election he loses after a whole lot of, other than general election, a whole lot of state elections that, uh, you know, were won under his leadership by his party, um, he, he kind of, you know, began to reassess his uh, governance and policy agenda. And uh, I think uh, there was a scare in his party about uh, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal running away with the 
black money narrative, which is a plank that he had fought the 2014 general election, Lok Sabha election on. So uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, he, 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 the whole thinking in, in the government was that all these things that we are doing, like making India and reforms and looking at, you know, a whole lot of uh, uh, GST, et cetera, is not something that's going to help us win elections. And we need something which is similar to the NREGA, because uh, a lot of people credit the NREGA for the re-election in 2009 of the UPA. So there's a search uh, for something like that. And uh, uh, that search probably is what has led them to, uh, leads them to demonetization. And then, uh, you know, I, I say in the book that he stops talking even in his Independence Day addresses from Red Fort about making India or industry. And he starts talking about startup India and farmers, et cetera. You know, the ministry gets renamed and all. So there's a sort of, um, uh, what they probably think is a cost correction, uh, moving away from the whole reforms and markets oriented uh, approach to economic policy uh, to wh what, you know, uh, is more like a continuation <laughs> with uh, what had been, you know, going on before. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm brutal. I, yeah, I, I think, um, uh, I think uh, there is this disorientation that the government goes through because of political reasons, uh, which is the uh, elections that they lose. So let, let's get back to demonetization and you've really covered it well within your book as well. In fact, you, you do talk about that the narrative was about black money at that point in time. And then there, are, there is of course a lot of changing narrative or ideology around it. But then if you really look at demonetization, one of the ideas was that it is actually going to do away with black money. Of course, we just got back something like close to 10,000, 11,000 crores uh, into the banking thing, or that is all that was gained. But at the end of the day, I think, do you think that it was done with a good intention to really cleaning up the system or uh, was it more like a political uh, thing? My uh, argument in the book is, uh, uh, and I'd like political analysts to uh, tell us, you know, if it's right or wrong. Uh, my argument in the book is that uh, Mr. Modi went ahead with demonetization, despite um, advice from not only the Reserve Bank of India, but also finance ministry to not go ahead with it. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Raghuram Rajan, who was the RPI governor at that point in time, on record, in fact, he has said that he had advised Mr. Modi against uh, going ahead with demonetization because it was not going to do much in terms of uh, helping with clean up the black, on the black money side. Um, and uh, so the RBI clearly was uh, not advising him to do this. Uh, we still don't know, by the way, who on whose advice he was acting. That piece of information has not come out. So we don't know, uh, uh, you know, where did this idea of demonetization come about from? And um, so uh, if, uh, you know, Mr. Modi has pressed ahead with something, and, uh, you know, it's important here to mention that Mr. Modi himself said in one of his speeches, uh, and I quote that speech in the book, um, that, you know, he, he had come to trust Dr. Raghuram Rajan quite a lot. Um, uh, he, he, he thought that he was a good economist and he, he was very good with explaining economic matters to Mr. Modi. Uh, so, uh, you know, so why is it that Mr. Modi has overruled advice that he has received from Dr. Raghuram Rajan? And uh, uh, the most likely reason is politics, uh, you know, to my mind. So, uh, so I, I don't think there was any economic, I mean, and, um, most economists uh, who, who speak um, about facts the way they are and analyze the way they are, uh, you know, not trying to take sides politically, uh, had on day one said that, you know, uh, this is not going to work. So it was quite obvious to econo uh, economic, trained economic uh, professionals. Um, so the only reason can be, uh, you know, to my mind, politics. And uh, as I said, you know, I also write in the book that it seems to be linked to the whole black money narrative that Mr. Kejriwal sort of, uh, you know, was likely to walk away with uh, because the, the initiatives that had been rolled out by the Modi government uh, in its first few months against black money, they had brought in a Benami law and, you know, a disclosure scheme, et cetera. That was not showing results, so uh, they needed to do something, you know, really big. Uh, that is what you know, and they needed to do something that would capture public imagination the way NREG had captured it. 
you know, the narrative. So uh, I think that is what led them uh, to uh, demonetization. So it did capture the public imagination in a way that because this whole decision was followed by the UP election, uh, uh, wherein uh, BJP did exceedingly well. Uh, if you if you really look at it, and then Yogi Adityanath Ji became the uh, chief minister there. Uh, so, uh, do you, do you think it did give them the political gains, but did not give the economic gains at all? I wouldn't know. That's for political analysts to say what exactly led to that. When I read pieces that say that it was demonetization, or uh, because people said that you know his intention was right, he may not have the government may not have succeeded in unearthing a lot of black money, but you know at least his intention was to get it. Uh, but I've also read, read pieces by political analysts uh, giving uh, other reasons, such as, you know, the caste calculations, etc. So I'm not so well versed with, uh, you know, those factors. So I wouldn't be able to say whether, whether it did, whether they could uh, get uh, political dividends or not. Um, definitely, nobody really criticizes them for it, even today, uh, you know, general people. Uh, they don't hold it. People seem to have forgotten, you know, the shock of uh, demonetization. So, so uh, you know, that does seem to be the case. Uh, but definitely they received no economic, I mean, the, it, 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 the economy, it was a great shock for the economy. And but the, the economy didn't recover from that shock for a long time. The surprising bit is that, and you do mention it in your book as well, and in, in your uh, papers that I read, uh, that there were a lot of people who were supporting this decision at that point in time and whether economists or business people or whatever. So was it a compulsion or was there a narrative uh, that did make sense to them that this would actually help or clean up the system or formalize the economy and whatever? How will it formalize the economy? The only way it will formalize the economy is by taking, by shifting business from uh, the informal to the formal sector, not by encouraging the informal sector to formalize. Right, you're you're shrinking the informal sector because you know it's not a level playing field. Uh, you know the shock, uh, the impact of the shock, and the ability to deal with the shock of the informal sector is much less than that of the formal sector. So the informal sector, uh, you know, uh, large parts of it will sort of not be able to cope with it, and their business will pass on to the formal part of the economy. So because it's not a level playing field, you know, when you're delivering that sort of a shock. So, uh, so I, if it's clear to me, I'm sure it's you know it would have been clear to a whole lot of business and you know economic um, analysts, um, uh, lay people. I you know uh, I don't know. I'm sure people see these things around them. In fact, the BJP tried to project this as uh, creative destruction. Uh, you know, and I write in the book that the only way this could have been creative destruction is, you know, uh, by sort of uh, destroying the informal economy and, you know, the formal economy absorbing, you know, the market share that, that the inf informal economy loses. So uh, I think, um, when, so when people were saying that, you know, uh, this is a good decision and uh, uh, I, I think it is just either they didn't know Oh, you know, but people who we thought should have known were uh, probably just trying to be, um, you know, uh, nice uh, and kind to the government. So, but I have to go back to your very initial point, you know, like uh, people want to whitewash and things at some points in time. And then, of course, Raghuram Rajan has written a book thereafter. Arvind Subramaniam, who was part of the government at that point in time, has criticized. But at that point in time, there was no criticism that was coming through. You can always say that there were government servants at that point in time or within the government. Uh, but there was no public discourse from people who were within the system. Uh, what would you see here? Like, was it a, a certain kind of a pointed thing in terms of like how the government was working, how the structure of the government was working, or what was it? I've actually uh, had the benefit of uh, talking about this very point with many of uh, the people who were in government and who have, uh, after exiting government, uh, criticized demonetization and uh, not only demonetization, but certain other decisions of government. And uh, what, what they say, and I think I would agree with them, what they say is that, you know, when you're part of the system, you know, you cannot criticize it from within publicly. You may uh, put it on file, uh, you know, to say that, 
uh, this particular decision will not work for such and such and such reason, and then you may get overruled, uh, you know, by a political boss. But you cannot come out and begin to say that the government is making a mistake in public while you're in government. That just sort of, um, you know, is very jarring. Uh, uh, so, so people have done that, you know, after exiting government. So, coming beyond uh, demonetization, like there was this whole GST thing. Without a doubt that GST was something with, that was being talked for years in India, uh, in one form or the other. Uh, the intention or the idea behind GST was good, but, uh, but then I think the implementation was always a questionable uh, thing. Uh, do you think GST as well had a huge impact on economy or created the shrillness uh, within the economy? The GST would have been a shock, even if it was well designed. Uh, there's no two ways about it because it's a very big change uh, with huge uh, compliance costs and requirements of uh, companies and informal sector, etc. Uh, but uh, I think what happened with uh, GST, and I write this uh, in the book as well, is that um, first of all, um, uh, you know, uh, GST, like most other economic policies, are viewed uh, by governments and not just Modi government, but like I said, you know, uh, the, the whole stimulus to deal with the global financial crisis in the UPA government, you know, it became a political decision eventually. And the same thing with GST that, you know, uh, economic policy becomes... Uh, a way of doing politics. So before the Gujarat election, state assembly elections, there is a reduction announced by the GST council on the GST taxation rates for certain uh, Gujarati uh, food items. Uh, so there's, you know, it becomes a tool for political messaging. And um, uh, if it, so, so, you know, GST is not designed to do these this kind of politics, you know. So when you begin to do these things, you're increasing rates, decreasing rates. You're opening yourself up to a whole lot of lobbying by different sectors, different companies. Uh, uh, you're not going to get a very good GST then. Uh, and um, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Vijay Kelka, who who was originally the person who sort of uh, wrote about. Uh, for government, uh, when Mr. Jaswan Singh was finance minister, Mr. Atal Bihari Rajpayee's government, uh, he he has said and written, you know, uh, publicly that uh, his whole concept of GST was one rate, you know, uh, one rate, uh, and uh, he was in fact, in, uh, you know, uh, called several times by the Modi government for advising on how the GST should be designed, and this is what he was advising them. Uh, and uh, he, is, he in fact told me in an interview that um, uh, Mr. Jaitley was on board, you know, uh, the finance minister who was uh, uh, spearheading the whole GST negotiation with the states on behalf of the central government. And he wanted a perfect GST because that's the only way you're going to get the maximum uh, economic gains by making the transition to a new indirect tax system. Uh, but uh, the states were not agreeing because the states uh, wanted the GST, as Mr. Dr. Arvind Subramanian has written, uh, you know, wanted the GST to resemble as closely as possible the system that GST was replacing. Why do you want a GST if you want the GST to replace the taxation system that the GST is going to replace? You know, so there's just so much anxiety in the states uh, about losing, uh, you know, tax revenues. Uh, and what that needed was, you know, for, for leadership in, in Delhi, to reach out to states and reassure them, you know, and say that, uh, you know, no, we need to do this. You know, we need to move to the GST because you have faith in the GST, because you want the GST to be something new and good. If you're going to want it to replicate what, you know, it's replacing, then why have it? So, so that whole uh, leadership was missing. And um, that's how the GST uh, could have been very good, but uh, did not end, it, end up being that good. And, and, and I think, um, probably in other uh, uh, government uh, handling the negotiation with the states from the center uh, would have succeeded in, in making the GST a better design GST. We don't know, but it's possible. So, Pooja, you know, like you do talk about Make in India as well. I, I think Make in India was a good initiative to begin with. There, there is 
there is no truth thinking about it. I think so. Uh, great idea that if you are able to make India a manufacturing hub, uh, powerhouse, and so on and so forth. Uh, but possibly it was the relic of the past 20, 30, 40 years, which probably did not make this uh, initiative a very huge success. And you do allude to that fact, like big economics is all about long-term things, like what decisions were happening. How do you really look at this situation? And possibly I'm asking that question for a simple reason, like what do you think can be the course correction? Because manufacturing could be something which does help us in enabling the creation of jobs. Yes, so uh, so uh, manufacturing uh, and Make in India is something that even the UPA government, uh, you know, had uh, announced and they wanted to pursue, but even they could not do it. Uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, we have to be fair and we have to say that it's not just the Modi government, you know, that sort of lost momentum and steam on the Make in India project. And the way... Um, it's not a, it's not a, you know, unlike demonetization, GST, it's not something, it's not an error that they made. It's the circumstances and it's all that you need to do for Make in India to succeed, which is just so challenging. Uh, you know, it's one thing to be able to improve your ranking on an ease of doing business, uh, you know, pecking order, but, um, you know, to truly make sure that, for instance, you know, Kanpur, uh, you know, it becomes easy for you to set up a factory in Kanpur. There's, there's just only so much that a central government can do. You know, you really have to work very closely with state governments, with local bodies, uh, local government. Uh, there are just so many things that go into um, making your, uh, uh, you know, your environment and ecosystem in which people do business easy, uh, that uh, it was always going to be very challenging. Uh, we know that the previous government did not do well on this challenge, and we know now that you know Modi government could not do well on this challenge. Uh, uh, what I, I definitely it's the way forward. Definitely, it's something that needs to be done. And and um, um, I should also add here that you know uh, before the Modi government was sworn in, but after the res election results were out in two thousand fourteen, if you recall, there was a gap between there was a few days between. Uh, you know, the cabinet getting sworn in and, uh, you know, the election results coming out. I had actually done an interview with Dr. Subramanian Swami, uh, BJP member, and he, I had asked him about uh, the economic policy that the Modi government was likely to pursue. And he told me that he expected uh, the farm sector to be a huge part of the economic agenda of the Modi government. And uh, he said that, you know, the reason for that was that he expected uh, decisions to be taken that would uh, spur a lot of uh, startup activity around the farm sector in small towns and villages and a lot of making, in, he didn't use the term making India, but you know, some food processing, for instance, industry, uh, you know, uh, around in those sectors, because that's how you absorb all the excess labor from the farms and create jobs. Uh, we didn't see that kind of focused, uh, uh, you know, making India uh, for the farm sector. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, initially the government tried, uh, you know, and um, they could not translate the goal into policy actions which would, you know, deliver the results. Um, uh, we have not seen, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Manufacturing GDP GDP growth was actually better under the UPA government than it is, you know, in in the Modi government's tenure. Uh, also, because exports have suffered, exports market is something uh, you know that they could not take advantage of, and there are many other reasons for that, including you know the foreign exchange, so uh, the foreign exchange rate uh, and competitiveness. So uh, I I, th I think that you know uh, for making India to succeed, you have to work with the states. Uh, um, you you have to have something like a GST council, oh, you know where you're going to uh, you know really really I mean your bank credit, uh, you know your ease of uh, you know getting electricity supply, water supply, you know pollution certificates, etc. 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 All of that, you know, really needs to get translated uh, close to the farms, like Dr. Subramanian Swami said. So quite interesting. 
but then of course you do talk about and uh, within the uh, as part of this uh, uh, whatever q and a that we are doing you did talk about uh, startup india uh, startup india has is something very interesting like of course you are trying to move towards the very idea of entrepreneurship but do you think that can solve the challenges that this country faces because i think the biggest challenge that we face is creating employment uh, for people yeah i uh, i don't think so you know i think we need these large factories where lots and lots of people get jobs you know i think that's what's going to solve the the the, the demand incomes employment problem uh you know it's, it's like i mean of all startups you probably know this better than me of of 100 startups how many survive not just in india but around the world so uh i don't think i mean we don't need a startup india i'm not going to dismiss it and say we don't need it we definitely need it but is that going to solve the jobs problem i don't think so i think we need to create conditions we are going to have these large factories with lots and lots of jobs and uh lots of lots of incomes getting generated so that then there's buying power so that there is demand uh, so that that becomes a you know a sort of sustainable growth uh, you know uh, trajectory um and we also need to look at the export market i know why we we are so pessimistic when it comes to exports mm -hmm. and so you 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 did this book until 2018 but 3 years have passed since this book came out so many things have changed so many things have been tried to be done how do you really look at the last 3 years so in the last 3 years the growth rate is halved mm -hmm. here um, i we've not really improved um you know we uh, one of the main problems that comes out in my book i think is the banking sector challenge we are we are nowhere close to resolving it you know and i mean to be fair uh, there's this whole covid challenge uh, you know but even before the covid challenge uh, good decision making was not taking place uh, so um, i i mean i i really what do i say uh, it's not been very good three years uh, you know after i finished i mean after where, where my book ends we've not really you know covered much ground on corrections after that so but then you know like to what you are saying is something interesting uh, but then if you really look at the stock market that seems to be giving a thumbs up to whatever be the policy so is it that the stock market guys are absolutely dumb naive they are not looking at this or there is another way of looking at this whole situation uh, what's happening because otherwise if what you were saying is absolutely true i'm not questioning your point here but what i'm saying is then why stock market is behaving the way it is I'm not a stock market analyst but my guess is that the stock market is not betting on the informal economy the stock market is not betting on um you know what the stock market is betting on is you know few companies which are really good indian companies you know uh, uh, they will continue to do well you know it, 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 it there's no reason for us to think that they will not do well for if anything if if large portions of the economy especially the informal economy don't perform well then all of their business is going to pass on to these formal listed companies and these companies will do well and that's what the stock market is the stock market is not betting on the entire economy the stock market is betting on a few companies who know how to uh, this is not a good way to say it, but uh, you know how to take advantage of these economic conditions we saw this last year when uh, a lot of these companies uh, reduced their manpower costs uh, you know and turned in profits uh, despite the covid crisis despite the lockdowns so that's what the stock market is betting on they're not really betting on you know uh, the entire economy so i uh, uh, the the stock market is very wise you know they know what they're doing it's just that uh, we should know what it is they are betting on you know they're When, not betting on the full economy so it's, it's just the 30 companies you're effectively saying which is creating the sensex 30 or 50 or 100 whatever the number is but uh, you know uh, so economists uh, talk about the k shaped recovery for instance after covid so uh, you know um, uh, economists such as dr ratan roy have talked about how you know there is a small section of the indian economy that does very well 
this section of economy, for instance, caters to, uh, let's say, government employees, you know, uh, people who draw pension and salaries from government, that source of demand is not going to go away, you know, uh, that is indexed, uh, uh, inflation indexed incomes, uh, you know, the job crisis does not affect them. So these are companies, uh, you know, uh, their fortunes are linked to a certain part of the country and the economy, which is relatively protected and cushioned, uh, you know, from uh, what goes on in the rest of the economy. So uh, that's what the stock market is probably betting on. But I, I'm not an I'm not an expert in these matters. I'm I'm just you know right. guessing. No, I, I think you're, you're giving a great answer here, and I think there's a perspective which we need to appreciate as to you know, what's really happening. You you did mention Ratan Roy, and in fact, uh, 18th of April this year, you had an interaction with Vivek De Roy. Uh, Vivek is a very dear friend, I must confess. Uh, and I watched your uh, conversation with him. Very interesting. Yes, yeah, so we, we did talk about uh, uh, his work in the area of translations and everything. So uh, he did does mention that what, in that interaction, that what the government is trying to do is more internal uh, than external. How, how do you really look at that point? I th actually, I, uh, I'm very fond of that interview because I thought that is an insight that... Uh, I haven't seen, uh, you know, uh, elsewhere. If what he's saying, uh, you know, is what is happening, um, then I have a lot of hope from, you know, uh, economic policy and uh, what's going on in the economy. Because what he says is that what the government is trying to do uh, is two things. One, uh, you know, through the whole census approach, they're identifying uh, um, people who need government support because they are not going to be able to negotiate the market economy uh, because they're disadvantaged to begin with. Like I said, there's not a level playing field. So uh, the, the, the socioeconomic census helps the government identify, uh, you know, beneficiaries who government needs to support in different ways, maybe a direct benef benefit transfer to, for instance, farmers, you know, of a certain category or the, uh, the subsidized uh, cooking gas, you know, that government provides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that, you know, they should focus on health and education more than anything else, but, but whatever it is, they, you know, so, uh, so, so that's the one set of things, uh, you know, uh, that they're doing. And the second set of things that he said they're trying to do is they're trying to make the government delivery mechanism better uh, to reduce link, uh, leakages. Uh, uh, through the direct benefit transfers. So, uh, so what that does is that, you know, we were just talking about how uh, one part of the economy, you know, kind of takes care of itself, but, and, you know, but there's, there's a larger section of the economy out there that, you know, uh, uh, is sort of disadvantaged. So if you begin to, uh, you know, if policy begins to address that lack of level playing field, uh, you know, then probably what they're trying to do is, uh, you know, reduce that gap, you know, in terms of opportunity, in terms of, uh, you know, your ability and capacity to uh, uh, respond to opportunities. Uh, so, uh, you know, if that happens, uh, you know, then that's, that's, that's good thinking, you know, uh, uh, in my view. But, um, we, we, we've, you know, it's 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 going to take a lot of time, even even if it's done very well. And we know how the Indian government, I mean, Indian capacity for doing things, the the government policy capacity is sort of not something that delivers often. Uh, so, yeah. Sure. Uh, but you know, you, you make a very important point here, and that is that there are those economic objectives of GDP, GDP growing, or whatever. And, as you allude to the point what Vivek has made, he's talking about delivering services to the needy. Uh, the government has talked about and very strongly over a period of time on things like ease of living. Uh, Sorry, ease of? Ease of living. Yeah. Uh, so they do talk about it. There are a lot of initiatives that have actually happened. There is this whole thing on uh, the Jam Smitty, Jandhan Aadhaar Mobile, access to banking, which has created some positive things as well. Of course, uh, I, I do agree with you that health and education is something which is uh, in a crisis of sorts right now because of the pandemic. Uh, how do you really look at this whole view of the government in terms of focusing on social objectives and very strongly? And, and probably it makes good politics as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good goal to have. Um, um, 
it is something that should be done. Um, my uh, one point of disagreement with the government, uh, and this is something that I asked him in the interview, although I did not uh, say what my disagreement is. You know, when they say uh, empowerment versus um, entitlement, um, uh, I, you know, if you're a human being, you know, there is a certain basic minimum that you should be assured of certain basic uh, access to education, food, clean air, you know, certain level of, you know, healthcare, et cetera. There are certain basics that I think uh, you shouldn't have to work, you know, uh, to, to earn those, you know, if you're a human being, that should be your basic uh, right. Uh, I disagree with the other, you know, the other side of the political divide, the ideological divide, where they say, let's just give people money for this, uh, you know, the basic income. In a country like India, I don't think that works because you can give people, you know, everybody uh, some money so that they can go and access these services. But where, who is providing these services at low costs for people to go and just go and buy them? Right? You can't just go and buy good education or good health care as we are seeing around us these days. Uh, in this country. So you cannot give cash. You have to provide services. And so I agree with the Modi government's, you know, whole concept of pro delivering basic services. Uh, my small disagreement with them is, you know, the whole narrative of entitlement versus um, empowerment. I think everybody, you know, um, should be assured of a certain basic minimum, uh, you know, human requirement. Uh, you should not have to work for it. Much appreciated. And you know, in your book, towards the end, you make a very important statement. And you say neither the UPA2 government nor the Modi government succeeded in defining an agenda for the type of policy reforms that are needed to sustain fast growth and which are not necessarily the same as needed to accelerate. So, what kind of policy agenda do you think should be the focus of the government if we really want to revive the growth and accelerate? and look at a very positive output for the country in the next three years. Yeah, so uh, so this uh, statement comes out of, uh, you know, uh, my conversations in for the book with uh, Dr. Arvind Bilmani, who was the chief economic advisor in the UPA government. And, uh, you know, it's basically about when there's a, when the economy's had a shock, for instance, a global financial crisis shock or the demonetization shock or currently the COVID shock. So you need a certain... Uh, set of policies to help the economy recover from that shock. So, for instance, everybody is talking these days about how government needs to increase its spending, or how the Reserve Bank of India is, uh, you know, uh, uh, making it easy for banks to give out loans. Uh, so, so those are examples of policies, uh, you know, reforms agenda where um, uh, they need, you know, you need to. Uh, bring the economy out of the shock and help it uh, recover. Uh, and then, you know, uh, for, for you to accelerate growth, you're going to have to do the Make in, Make in India kind of reforms because you're going to have to increase the number of people with certain level of incomes, you know, who can go out and buy products, goods and services. So acceleration. And then you need for sustenance. So, you know, like, the 2G scam happened or the coal scam happened, you know, natural resources, access to natural resources uh, to sustain that acceleration in growth. Uh, you know, you have to make sure that your know, industry is going to be able to access, uh, uh, you know, the, the resources they need. Uh, um, and for that, you know, you, you cannot have, uh, you know, the government's, uh, you know, uh, political parties heading governments, uh, you know, and kind of the whole mess that we saw, for instance, with the 2G scam, et cetera. So uh, if, so the reforms that followed, uh, you know, for instance, uh, with spectrum and you know, coal allocations, et cetera, those were needed for ensuring that you sustain growth. Mm -hmm. And so coming forward and let's talk about today. So we are in midst of a very major crisis of sorts. Uh, it's a massive catastrophe uh, that we have gone through in the last uh, 20, now uh, sorry, since 2020. Uh, something which is, it's a pandemic which has happened. It's a disease which is not created by 
the government or whatever it has just happened. Uh, yes, I'll agree that we were possibly not prepared for the second wave and things. What do you think is the economic impact of this at this point in time? And as a journalist, you, when you're really looking at things around us, uh, you're much aware of what you're seeing on the ground. So what, what do you really see right now? So I have to say here that, you know, as a journalist, I'm constrained this time around because I'm not going out, you know, so I'm not so much in contact with uh, general people. I'm not on the field. I, I'm also working from home and I'm not seeing, I've been saying this, that I'm not seeing so many reports. Now we're seeing reports of the health crisis from the rural areas, but last year, all of last year, we didn't see much reporting from rural areas on the economic shock and the economic crisis. Uh, so it was a little difficult to assess, you know, what exactly um, uh, COVID was doing to people's lives uh, and the economy. Uh, but um, uh, I think, uh, you know, so I'm sort of more, in, more just making a guess over here. I'm going by what, what I'm reading, what, you know, people, uh, experts are saying. But this seems to me like a really severe shock really severe shock. I mean, uh, there are people who, many of who would lose uh, their income earning uh, members of their families, uh, you know, irreplaceably. Uh, there are businesses and individuals who suffered shocks. Uh, we don't know how reversible, you know, these income shocks are going to be. Um, it's a little difficult to say right now how severe the shock will be and how long it will last. But it is more, I mean, you know, when, when I see uh, people say that, oh, we'll recover very quickly, uh, you know, oh, it's, it's just, you know, going to be behind us. Maybe for a certain part of the economy, as we have seen again and again, in the case of all the shocks that we've been seeing in the past few years, uh, yeah, you know, if you're a government work, working in government, then the only shock you have suffered is that, you know, your inflation indexation has been frozen. Uh, that's it. Uh, if you're somebody who, uh, you know, receives dividends and that's your main source of income, then, you know, you're probably better off because many companies are more profitable today than they were before COVID. Uh, but if you're somebody, you know, who's lost a job, you know, uh, or who's suffered a pay cut, how, how long is it going to take you for you to come back, you know, to your pre-COVID level? Um, how much your circumstances are changed? How many number of people belong to this category is something we don't know. But um, I, I think it's not something that can just be dismissed. It's, it, it seems to me that it is going to be a substantial number. And uh, GDP, absolute terms, uh, is now less than what it was before COVID. How long we are going to take to come back to the pre-COVID level of absolute GDP number, also we don't know yet. It may take one year, it may take more than that. Then if you really look at certain indicators here, uh, sorry for the dogs uh, behind, but I can't do much about it. But uh, if you really, sorry for that. Uh, if you really look at the, numbers that are coming through Pew Research, Pew suggests that the number of poor in India have possibly risen by about 120 to 150 million post COVID. That, yeah, that's what the estimates are saying. That, that, mm -hmm. That's what, uh, yeah, that those are the numbers that are being put out. Uh, you know, uh, even before COVID, uh, there's World Bank uh, research that has said that, you know, in India, what happens is when people exit poverty, they're able to exit poverty, they do fall back into poverty, because the main reason for that tends to be a health crisis in the family. Uh, you know, one health crisis in the family is enough to, to put a family, you know, uh, back into poverty. And we are seeing that COVID, at least in the second wave, you know, has hit uh, families. And, you know, in the first wave, it was more about urban um, and uh, uh, the upper classes. Uh, but in the second wave this time round, we are seeing that a lot of the um, uh, uh, cases are coming from, uh, you know, uh, rural India or, or even in urban India from the, from uh, low income earning families. So uh, it's not. I mean, one would expect that uh, you know this kind of poverty uh, sort of reversal, the ga reversal of the gains that we had made, you know, is probably taking place. So, you're crystal ball gazing today to say that 
where do you think we can be? We've had this great idea or a dream of a $5 trillion economy. I think it's a respectable idea that we need to really move towards that direction. Where do you think, or when do you think we can get there now? Because given this crisis, uh, we have really been pushed back uh, without a doubt. I think we are close to about 2.8, 2.9 trillion dollars. We, we are possibly close to about 2.5 trillion. And right now, uh, we don't have the numbers, but it's just a guess uh, here. Uh, but now the question is, how, what is a setback? How many years for us to really get back to normal? Uh, I wouldn't know. <laughs> that's, you know, that's for the economists, uh, you know, to answer. I have no expertise to answer that question. I so really have your, no. But then if, if you were to guess, or if you were to really see, uh, how would you really want to look at it? I, I really don't know. I don't even know the method of you know, assessing something like this. Sure. But then I have to ask you this uh, question. Uh, if you were sitting in the seat of two very interesting people here, uh, Nirmala Sitaraman or Prime Minister Modi, uh, as somebody who has studied the history of Indian economy, uh, at least at the times when it, it was going through some crisis, it was seeing uh, the build up. What do you think we should be doing right now? Two or three things which can really help us uh, really move ahead because as a collective effort it's important that we really look at those ideas and really move ahead what are those three or four things that you would you think we should be doing i think the first thing uh, is getting the vaccination policy right um, uh, i think one of the main things that can help india shorten the duration of the covid crisis you know and emerge from the shock is getting the vaccination uh, policy right um, the second thing is um, that, uh, you know, they're going to have to find, and, you know, uh, uh, the finance minister has been saying that, you know, uh, and she's not wrong. I mean, I agree with her. She's been saying that, you know, it's so difficult, uh, you know, for central government policy, economic policy to find touch points with informal economy workers. Uh, uh, you know, you cannot... You don't have the tools, you know, I mean, you can't help them with taxation, you know, because they operate in part of the economy where, you know, they don't pay income tax, they probably don't even, you know, come under the threshold of it for the GST, etc. Uh, so, you know, the taxation tool is not available to her to address the needs, you know, of the provide relief to uh, large numbers of people. Uh, if you're going to um, make transfers, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, what is the channel through which you're going to do that? Uh, so, so you know, they, it, it really is very tr tricky. I, I would, you know, think that you would need to find a way of helping uh, people in the informal economy with relief, you know, uh, and uh, uh, relief. And then, uh, you know, after relief, some income opportunities. Um, how do you do that, you know, in a short period of time? We know how, I mean, in my book I've written because uh, of how you do it, you know, when you deal with the job crisis, etc. How you do it in the case of this particular shock, um, it's for the economists to answer. I really don't have the answer to that. I don't have the technical training to answer that question. But I, her goal should be, you know, to help people uh, who have suffered income shocks, uh, you know, how to first provide relief and how to sort of, you know, regenerate the income uh, opportunities for them, you know, how they should uh, be able to earn incomes again, you know, the opportunities. Uh, and third, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, a lot of companies, small, big, large, are going to suffer. Uh, so uh, they're going to have, you know, again, uh, ramifications for the banking sector, uh, the whole insolvency, insolvency problems, uh, you know, and, and, and the small scale sector, you know, they're, they're going to have to find ways of, uh, again, same thing, help them overcome the shock, help them revive themselves. Um, they probably have put out a list of the things that they need, you know, they need to formulate policy around that. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, um, they need to formulate policies in a cogent way. Uh, you know, often we find that policy packages uh, conflict or are not well thought out. Uh, 
maybe they only do two or three things like you're saying what are the three things they should do but you know whatever those three things are done they should be very well thought out and they should not you know conflict or contradict and uh, you know i think economists need to sit and design these packages uh i don't think there should be scope for politics in this and um i also want to say that i don't think the opposition in india is playing a very constructive or a positive role you know i mean uh, uh the country's going through a crisis i i don't want to hear you know uh, mr rahul gandhi making the kind of tweets that he makes you know about crocodiles etc it's just um, can we all please be a little more responsible you know i really think that the opposition needs to um, sort of play a more constructive role and i just like the government needs to uh, you know think cogently about the policy decisions they need to make i i'm not in a position to say what it is that they need to do but i would like to say that you know these are the things they should take care of mm -hmm. very well and last two questions sir uh, from you pooja Uh, one is that you said vaccine getting the vaccination policy right without a doubt like vaccination or getting people vaccinated is going to be one of the biggest things that is going to help us revive or rev up or really kick start the process what is it that we need to do right with the vaccination policy given the circumstances that we possibly don't have the adequate number of vaccines right now we've got late to order what what is it that we can do on immediate basis if i really ask you Yeah, vaccination is vaccination is something that, that I can answer because I've been speaking to economists about it, and what they tell me is that uh, you know, uh, so let's you know what is done you, that can't be repaired. So what needs to be done today is that we need to get the supplies, and um, you know, uh, the state governments are not going to be able to get the supplies. So it is the central government that has to take full responsibility of getting the supplies, identifying the suppliers. um uh, you know if they need to help companies manufacture in india then identify you know where all these manufacturing facilities are how quickly those contracts you know what are the legal processes that need to be gone through uh, you know how those manufacture how that manufacturing can be done in india and stepped up and you know how those supplies uh, come about uh and uh, then you know distributed to uh, the states and various agencies so so that the administration of the vaccinations can be done now uh, here um uh, the, there's this whole conversation about the uh, you know the ip the intellectual property uh, conversation uh, where i'm reading two conflicting views one view says that you know it's not the ip that's actually uh, stalling the whole uh, vaccination supply process and there's another side that's insisting that you know that's the main thing um my guess is that you know if it was really you know the compulsory licensing uh, then uh, the com the manufacturer that has the license would have by now gotten into contracts with other manufacturers for whatever you know price uh, it needs to be compensated with and they would have voluntarily done this if they've not done it means that nobody is offering that price which probably means you know government needs to spend some money and there's a subsidy that is required um, Uh, but whatever it is you know the, the whether it is the inter intellectual property issue or it is identification of manufacturing facilities like i was reading in the paper there's this facility a government uh, uh, a public sector facility there's this one example but there are likely to be many more in in chennai there's a factory in disuse uh, for some time and it will take very little for that factory to be revived and you know for it to be start producing uh, so you know that process needs to be gone through you know who is going to manage that factory how is it going to be done you know those are policy decisions that need to be taken and those should be taken you know i mean the only way to get the vaccine is to produce it you know and you have the world's leading manufacturers and developers of vaccines offering to help uh, you know so so uh, ha have that conversation with them ask them what it is that you know can be done for those manuf that manufacturing base in india to be increased quickly and uh, you know if it needs you to spend money please spend money because that's you know uh, if you spend that money you're going to lose much less in terms of economic loss economic activity loss tax revenue loss if this crisis prolongs uh, so mm -hmm. very nice and you know like we just did a back of the envelope calculations looking at the number of people who have died because of this crisis 
the economic impact of lost lives uh, by multiplying their number of years lost to very simple minimum wage, it is close to about $100 billion. Uh, that's a crazy big uh, loss, but I think it's a very unfortunate situation. But we always end this conversation with a very important question. Three things, two or three things that you would ask the audience to read, to get more knowledge, or what are your two or three best books that you might have read and that you would suggest to everybody? On the Indian economy? Anything. What do you think has transformed your thinking? What has had an impact in your life? Two or three books. Uh, in, uh, so I wouldn't give such uh, uh, umbrella uh, answers because uh, I, I would need to think about that. I can say that what are the three books that I have really enjoyed reading in the last few months a lot? Uh, um, there's a book by my uh, professor, late Professor Tendulkar on the Indian reforms. Uh, uh, some parts of those books are no longer, I mean, they're, they're dated now. Uh, but uh, so uh, his book on reforms. Uh, the second book that I have enjoyed reading, uh, you know, is a book called The Cat's Cradle. In fact, I have it right here. Let me show it to you. This is the book. Um, it's a book about, you know, uh, it, 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 it's a classic about, you know, uh, how nothing has any meaning. <laughs> uh, it fits very well, you know, with the whole mood in India right now. It's, there's, there's, a, there's a fictitious religion uh, in this book where um, they worship lies. <laughs> you know so uh, yeah so the cat's cradle and which is the third book that i have enjoyed reading uh, recently uh, so uh, uh, anything by even more he's he's one of my favorite authors and it's it's good to read funny things these days so you know let's just scoop because that's about journalism <laughs> i almost reread it every year Awesome, awesome, uh, Pooja. But in fact, I would like to add the two more books to this. Uh, one, please uh, read The Lost Decade, uh, if you've not read it. It's, it's a wonderful read on 10 years of economic uh, reforms and how things have really happened. And the other one I would suggest is you read The Age of Awakening. That's a book on Indian economic history that I had actually done and was published in 2018 as well. But Pooja, this has been just such an interesting interaction. Uh, I just learned so much from you on this. Uh, thanks a lot. And look Thank forward you. to Thank you. Thank you so much. Well and be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much.